All right, Devin, you're good. good. Whenever you are ready. Okay. Well, good evening. How you guys doing? Good. Good. All right. So, so I'm going to stand right here. I hope that's okay. Uh, I know you probably want me to stand in the front, and I do too, but I can't because I have to be by my machine. I have lots of on-hand stuff to do during this talk, so uh, you guys might want to kind of shift a little bit this way if you want. Okay. Um, okay, let's get started. I have a lot of stuff to talk about tonight. Uh, first of all, all these slides are not slides at all, so I don't have any keynote, I don't have any PowerPoint, I don't have anything like that. This is all HTML5, so if you didn't notice when I started this, I'm actually running this presentation in the browser, and I'm just running it in full screen mode with Chrome. And I'm doing that with uh, some JavaScript and CSS and HTML that I downloaded from Google uh, from HTML5rocks.com. Uh, slides.html5rocks.com down at the bottom. If you're interested, uh, you can make slideshows with just HTML5. So what I've done in this talk is uh, I have uh, uh, one demo that I'm going to show you outside of this slideshow. Uh, but otherwise, I've taken all my code and all my demos and actually just put it right in the slideshow. So since it's HTML5, I just put all the examples right in there. So, so the slides are from HTML5 Rocks. And the speaker is from HTML5 Denver. So I'm the organizer for the HTML5 Denver user group. And uh, I needed to get a total of 24 speakers for this year because we have two talks every month. And uh, so I got a hold of Wesley and, and begged him to come to Denver and promised him that I would come here and speak if he would come to Denver and speak. And he graciously agreed to do that. And so he's going to come out next month. Right, Wesley? That's right. <laughs> okay. I'm going to book that ticket tonight. I just wanted to hear you publicly say that. <laughs> uh, so, so my name is David Geary. Um, I just wrote a book for HTML5 Canvas. I suppose that's the most part of why I'm here, talking to you about games. I'm also working on a game book. I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. I'm going to show you a game tonight. It's, it's the platformer uh, to which the title of this talk applies. And uh, the images that I'm going to use in this game are courtesy of an open source game called Replica Island. So Replica Island is an Android game. It was written three or four years ago. It's a pretty popular game, open source game, written by a guy named Chris Pruitt uh, on Twitter. He is at Chris underscore Pruitt. If you're interested, he posts a lot of interesting game-related stuff. <coughs> uh, anyway, the, the game Replica Island is open source. And I really liked his graphics, so I asked him if I could use his graphics, and he said, sure. So, I am. Most of the programming techniques I'm going to talk about tonight are in my book, in my Canvas book. So uh, you'll want to go out and buy at least two copies of the Canvas <laughs> We handed out three copies. David, David sent us three copies to hand out, so we've, we've already handed out a few of them. Okay. <laughs> I'm also doing a series of articles on IBM Developer Works. So IBM has a Developer Works site, and they have lots of really interesting articles. In fact, let's just take a quick look. So if, if you go to IBM Developer Works, here is the URL, ibm.com slash developer works. Uh, lots of interesting stuff, as you can see. In fact, that article at the top there is an article that was just released today. And believe it or not, I wrote it. <laughs> what, how, how can that be? I don't know. But anyway, that's if you want to read about HTML5 components, uh, and you weren't at Dev Nexus to hear me speak about it, you can go read about that. Uh, here is the game uh, series. So I have a series of articles on HTML5 2D game development. Uh, right now, there are six articles in the series. Uh, I think there's going to be somewhere between 10, 10 and 12 when I'm done. And then I'm going to take all those articles and turn that into a book and add some new material uh, in the near future. OK, let's take a look at the platform. OK, so this is the game. Uh, <laughs> right. Very good. So this is a platformer, and uh, I'm not hooked up to sound. 
but you can hear it, right? Because we're all really quiet. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so I have sound going. This is a basic platform game. I have this little runner uh, girl here by underneath the back there. And she runs and captures sapphires and rubies and coins. Uh, the bees and the bats are bad guys. The, the jewels and the coins are, are good things that he wants to capture, she wants to capture. Um, if she runs into a bat or a bee, she blows up like that. And then I re reset and start again. Um, you may have noticed a couple things. When I start the game, the instructions on the bottom are fully opaque. And the scoreboard on the top and the lives indicator, you can barely see them. I'll start it again and you can see it. And because when, when the game starts, I want them to focus on, on the instructions. They see the instructions and then I fade the instructions out. I fade in the score and the, uh, the little live life indicator up on top. Uh, this is something that's really important in an HTML5 game. If you write games for Xbox or some gaming console, it's, it's a very tightly controlled environment that your game runs in. Uh, when your game runs under HTML5, it's just chaos, right? Um, and in fact, this game is running slowly now. It really should be, but the reason it's running slowly is because I'm running my slideshow, and I have about 15 animations in that thing, so I have a lot of stuff going on here. And so when, when you run an HTML5 game, you, you really need to be aware of the frame rate and you need to give the user some kind of indication when, when the game starts running slowly, and that's what I'm doing here. Okay, you might notice too, when, when the game starts, I drop the runner out of the sky and drop her onto that first platform. That. Okay, I'm gonna, should I do that? Yeah, I'm gonna get rid of this so we don't get that. Okay, let's just play. So I'm using the J key to jump or the, the F key. I got repetitive strain injury from the J key, so I added the F key later on. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you get three lives, and then when it's done, I bring up this uh, semi-transparent, I don't know what you call that, but dialog box, I suppose, uh, that shows credits, and you can play again, you can tweak your score if you want. And so I'm gonna open up Twitter, and it says, I scored 350 playing this HTML5 canvas platformer at ATL HTML5. Then we can tweet that. Hey. Um, and then you can play the game again if you want. So um, that's a game that there's a lot of stuff going on here. I have a, a particle system that creates the smoke and the fire that's coming out there. I'm not going to talk about the details of that here, but, but you can read about it uh, in my book. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so let's, let's see if we can get through to the end here. So you might have noticed that button, if I land on that button, I blow up the bad guys on the next platform. And if I don't land on that button, I'm in trouble. Because the bad guys are impenetrable. So I have to land on that button. Oh. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. All right. One more time, I can get to the end of this. I, I am, by the way, the world's best player at this game. <laughs> so let's let's try one more time. Oh, okay. yeah. All right. Well, anyway, there it is. So that's that's the game we're going to talk about. Okay, 
And, and here's what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to start off giving you a, a very short overview of HTML5 Canvas graphics. Uh, and then we'll dive into animation. A good deal of this talk uh, concerns animation. And I'll show you how to do animation the right way in JavaScript. We'll also talk about how you can do animation the wrong way. Uh, we'll look at something I call time-based motion. Uh, when things move, when, when sprites move in a game, um, their, their rate of movement should not depend on the frame rate at which your game runs. In fact, what I'm saying is if your game slows down, your character should not slow down in the game. And I'll show you how to maintain speed when a frame rate drops. Uh, we'll talk about performance. We'll talk about scrolling background and parallax to simulate three dimensions. We'll look at sprites and sprite behaviors and how you implement them and use them. We'll look at sprite animations and then we'll finish up with collision detection and get out of here probably about 3 a.m. <laughs> so let's, let's start with Canvas. So um, HTML5 Canvas is, is an element in HTML5. It's one of the new elements. And inside the Canvas element is a graphics context. By default, I, it's a 2D graphics context. There is also a 3D graphics context, which is otherwise known as WebGL. Most of you probably know that. Um, Canvas nowadays is hardware accelerated in just about every modern browser. And, and when I say modern browser, that's not a dig at, at Microsoft. <laughs> I'm including IE in that group. Um, and so we have WebGL, which is, which is 3D graphics, and we have Canvas, which is 2D graphics. But as I said, Canvas on most platforms is hardware accelerated. And what that means is Canvas is WebGL. Uh, that's how hardware acceleration is done. They take the Canvas API calls, they translate them into WebGL calls. So when you see me running this game up here, I'm using the Canvas API, but under the covers, the browser is using WebGL to, to move the graphics around. So if you have hardware acceleration on Canvas, you're gonna get really good performance. And as I said, nowadays, uh, most browsers do have hardware accelerated Canvas, even on an iPad. Uh, this game that I just showed you will run at a rock solid 60 frames per second on an iPad. So. Okay, so let's talk about Canvas a little bit. What I want to do is I, I want to show you some things you can do with Canvas. Here's one thing you can do. You can draw sunglasses. <laughs> and what, what I've done here is I've done, drawn two circles and I've set the circles as the clipping region. So the clipping region is both of those circles. It can be two, two separate geographical regions in, in the canvas. And what I've done is I've applied a filter to the whole canvas that darkens all the pixels and increases the, uh, the contrast a little bit so it looks like sunglasses, but I've clipped that filtering to those two circles. So when I apply the filter to the entire picture, because I've set the clipping region to those two circles, it's only applied to those two circles and it looks like I have sunglasses. So I was looking on Amazon when I was writing my book and I noticed if a book has a really big cover on Amazon, they give you a little square you can move around inside the little picture and it shows you a big picture of the big cover. And I thought that was pretty cool. So that's what this is. I can drag around this viewport inside this small representation of this really large picture. And whatever is in that rectangle is shown in the canvas underneath. And as you can see, I'm getting really good performance here. I can't really get ahead of that with my finger unless I go out. So very good performance. Here's another thing you can do with the clipping region. And now I have a magnifying glass. And as I drag this around, I magnify whatever, I, whatever I'm on top of. And I'm doing the same clipping thing. Instead of doing a filter that darkens and increases the contrast, I'm actually capturing the pixels inside that circle, scaling them up and pushing them back into the canvas clipped to that circle. So I get the effect of what, what looks like a magnifying glass. And I can change the size of the magnifying glass and I can change the magnification level as I drag this thing around. 
Okay? So, so that's just a real quick overview of some of the things that you can do with Canvas. Of course, there's tons and tons of other stuff. And, and if you want to learn more stuff about Canvas, I recommend that you buy a really good book. And what would the name of that book be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't, then I'll get bad reviews if I say the name. <laughs> okay, any questions or comments on graphics or Canvas? Is that okay? Hey, by, by the way, don't, don't be shy. I'll take questions as we go along. But the best time to ask a question is when you think of it, not later. So if you, if you come up with a question or a comment, uh, feel free to get my attention anytime. We'll, we'll take them as we go along. Okay, let's talk about animation. So we can draw things. Uh, we can use the clipping region, which we'll talk about more as we go through this talk. Uh, we can scale things. And we have really good performance in Canvas. And of course, we can do animation. So here I'm doing, as you can see from the title of the slide, just some very basic animation. I'm just moving these three disks around and bouncing them off the wall. Here's the wrong way to do that. The wrong way to do that is to write that loop at the bottom. The function at the top is okay, but that loop is big trouble, right? And you guys probably already know this, right? Because JavaScript runs on a thread all its own, and when the browser releases control, JavaScript has control, and the browser is frozen. So what we don't want to do is go into an endless loop, because then we, our JavaScript will have control, and the browser will never have control again. You'll freeze up the browser, and you'll freeze up your animation. So. This is not a good thing to do. So here's an alternative. You want to let the browser breathe a little bit. So here, instead of just having an endless loop, what I'm doing is I'm telling the browser to call my animate function at approximately 60 frames per second. The word approximately is important here because set interval, if you look in the spec, browser vendors are allowed to pad the time that you send to set interval. Now you send them milliseconds, you send them a number that represents milliseconds, like 16, and you probably expect that set timeout and set interval will do the right thing at that exact time, but that's not true. They're allowed to pad those numbers if they want. They could wait 10 seconds. Of course, they won't, but they might not call you at exactly 16 seconds. So if you have time-critical animation, which of course you do in a, in a video game, you cannot use set interval or set timeout. Here's another problem with set interval and set timeout. That is that you set the, the frame rate. So when I set, call set interval here, and I tell it to call animate in 1,000 divided by 60 milliseconds, that equates to 60 frames per second, I'm just guessing at 60 frames per second. To be honest, because somebody told me one time, most monitors refresh at 60 frames per second, so that's what I should use. I don't even know if that's true, but I just do it, okay? because I don't know any better. I, I assume that the browser knows better than I do, and we'll talk about that in just a second, but right now. So I don't know the best time to draw the next animation frame. Surely the browser knows better than I do, don't you think? So, we have a solution that lets the browser decide when I draw the next frame, not me. And that's a new method called request animation frame. And it started off as a method in Mozilla, actually, and it was called Mo's request animation frame. And then the WebKit guys got on board and they created WebKit request animation frame. And you know how this story goes, right? We have WebKit, we have Mozilla, we have a standard, so we have all these things, right? So this is how request animation frame works. What you do is you call request animation frame and you pass it a function. And basically when the browser's ready to draw the next animation frame, it calls your function and it expects you to draw the next animation frame. And inside that function, you once again call request animation frame and give it a reference to the same function, and now we're in a recursive loop. Does that make sense? Of course, there's a problem here, and that is that we have WebKit way to do this, we have a Mozilla way to do this, we have an IE way to do this, and we have a standard way to do this. And no one browser supports all those ways, and some browsers support one way and some browsers support another. <coughs> 
So this is a very simple polyfill that returns a function. If it finds one of those functions that I just mentioned, it returns it. If it doesn't, it returns a function that I wrote that tries its best to animate at 60 frames a second, because that's about the best I can do. So this is a very simple polyfill for request animation frame. You might notice at the top I called it request next animation frame to differentiate it from the real method, because I don't want to overwrite the real method in, in the browser. Uh, but this does not account for numerous browser bugs. So for instance, <coughs> Chrome will not send you the time to your animation function. So this request animation frame will send the time to your animation function. Uh, Chrome does not do that in certain releases. So that polyfill doesn't count for those, um, but you can find some that do. Um, so here's the, the animate function. I just call request next animation frame at the bottom to get it started. And that calls the first animation frame, calls my animate function inside my animate function. I clear the whole canvas. I draw the background. I draw everything else. And then I call request next animation frame again. And when the browser's ready, it calls the same function. And I keep going. So David, the request uh, animation frame, does that so that's guaranteed to call your function 60 times per second? No. Uh, it, it's guaranteed. There, to paint your function. What's I guess is it, is it at some point guaranteeing you to paint your canvas 60 times per second? Yeah, so, so, so the question is, does request animation frame guarantee that you're going to be drawing 60 frames per second? No, it doesn't. Um, it just does its best to, to call it's you. It's better than set interval, I guess. Uh, it's better than set interval because the browser is selecting when to draw the next animation frame, not you. And when you decide, the number you give the browser for set timeout and set, set interval it can be padded. So th those are the two reasons why you want to use request animation. Does that make sense? <coughs> Got one over there? Oh, yeah. Is there a maximum version of that? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I, I haven't hit it, and, and I just believe I've tested it. <laughs> yeah. did, did everybody hear the question? Is there a maximum recursive recursion depth? Sorry about that. Okay, so that's how we do animation. Don't use set timeout and set, set interval for time critical animations. If you're doing a clock and you're going to move the second hand every second, set timeout and set interval are just perfect for that. But if you want to say, hey, I want to move this sprite 10 pixels in this direction in exactly 16 milliseconds, then you need request animation for it. Okay, here's, here's something else to think about. And that is frames per second. So if you're going to write a game, you, you almost have to calculate your frame rate. And we'll talk about why you have to calculate your frame rate in a second. Yeah? How does it handle multiple yeah. animations? How does it actually differentiate? I'm sorry. I'm, you, I'm really you're talking sure. about, are you talking about drawing multiple canvas yeah, elements yeah, on the yeah, page? Yeah, like one canvas tag here, one canvas tag there, and yeah. controlling the frame rate for each, I guess is what he's, he's talking um, about. Yeah, you could do that. You could have multiple canvases and call request animation frame from all of them. Would it be the same rate, do you know? For each canvas? Yeah. Probably not. Okay. I don't know, actually. I've never, I've never tried a bunch of canvases at once. Uh, but that is another way to do that. What, what I'm doing in here, by the way, what you see up here is just one canvas, and I'm drawing into the canvas. So the, those circles, those disks that you see are not separate canvases. They're just me drawing over and over at different locations. Notice I'm getting really good frame rate here as far as numbers go. But that's actually a really bad frame rate. We'll talk about why in a minute. So here's how you calculate frame rates. So this is how I calculate frames per second. So what I do is I, do, I multiply a thousand by frames over milliseconds. Okay, hang on. Let's let's do this. 
Okay, so here's my function to calculate the frame rate. And you see in the second line of the function, I have FPS equals 1,000 divided by now minus last time. Now is now. Last time is the last time I drew an animation frame. So now minus last time is the amount of time it took for the last frame to draw. It's the number of milliseconds per frame, right? Is everybody with me? Okay. If I divide 1,000 milliseconds over seconds <coughs> by milliseconds over frame, that's the same as taking 1,000 milliseconds and multiplying it by frame over milliseconds, right? Because dividing by two is the same as multiplying by one half. Are, are you guys with me here? <laughs> sort of? Okay, so, so notice the units cancel out, the milliseconds cancel out. And what I'm left with is frames per second. So, so if you didn't follow all that, the moral of the story is just take the amount of time it took to do the last frame and divide a thousand by that and that's your frame rate. Okay? Of course, it's not really a frame rate really, because it's just the amount of time it took for the last frame, right? And so, and so you might nitpick and say what you really should be doing is keeping track of, say, the last 10 frames, see how long it took, average those out so you can get the average frame rate. I've never found that to be necessary. I just get the last frame rate and use that and everything's worked fine. So. Okay, this is an interesting example. And this shows the difference between hardware acceleration and non-hardware acceleration. I didn't know that it would when I wrote it, uh, but I found out that it did. So, what I have here is I have two identical applications. They do exactly the same thing. And when I run this, you'll notice that when just one is running, it's running at about 60 frames per second. If they're both running, they're both running at about 60 frames per second, okay? Because Chrome is hardware accelerated. You're really looking at WebGL here, moving that stuff around. And I, I would imagine I could probably add three or four more identical applications to get 60 on all of them. So what I'm gonna do, because <coughs> this demo doesn't work right, if I don't slow down, I'm gonna go to Safari And I'm going to run this in Safari. Because I'm still running, believe it or not, Snow Leopard. <laughs> I'm scared to death to upgrade because I use voice recognition software, but that's a whole other story. Um, and under Snow Leopard, Safari is not hardware accelerated. So here we go in Safari. Now you'll notice a little bit slower. Frame rate's kind of all over. If I do two, <clears throat> now here's the effect I want you to see. Right now, the circles in the top are moving at a certain speed. When I press animate and start the, the application below, the balls on the top are gonna slow down because the frame rate's gonna slow down. Are you ready? Here we go, you gotta watch. Watch, just watch the top. Did you see him slow down? If you can't see it, just watch one ball and you'll see it slow down. Okay, you see that? Okay, that's because what I'm doing is I'm moving each of those balls, the same number of pixels for each frame. If my frame rate slows down, so do the balls. Does this make sense? I never ever want that to happen in my game, right? If, if you have, two, in a multiplayer game, two guys coming down a corridor and one guy has a more powerful computer, you don't want him to get to the corner first so he can shoot the other guy, right? Because the other guy has a PC. <laughs> As the killer has a man. Um, so, what you want to do is you want to do time-based motion. And now that I've clicked that checkbox, watch how fast the balls on the top go, and notice they always go at the same rate, which is what you have to do in a game. Right? Your game cannot slow down when somebody starts a video on YouTube. Okay? It has to go the same. Now, 
I'm not hardware accelerated, so it's not pretty. It's jittery, it's jumpy, but stuff is where it's supposed to be at the right time, which is very important in every game. So, okay. Interestingly enough, because Chrome is hardware accelerated, you can't see that effect anymore in Chrome. You used to be able to when I first wrote this example because Chrome was not hardware accelerated. Uh, but now it doesn't make any difference whether I put that checkbox or not. Yeah? So does this answer his question about having two channels on one page? Uh, I don't know if it answers his question, but this is definitely two canvases on one page, yeah. Yep. That's what you want? All right, cool. <laughs> yes, you can definitely do that. In fact, it's a common technique to have multiple canvases on top of each other in a game and have you know sprites in a canvas of their own. I'm not doing that here, but, but it's very possible to do that. And the canvas element is pretty lightweight, too, so you can, you can do that with good performance. Okay, to do time-based motion, which means you're going to move at the same rate no matter what the frame rate is, it's really simple. What you do is you specify your velocity in pixels per second and calculate pixels per frame. So what I want to do is every animation frame, given a velocity of a sprite, I want to calculate how many pixels to move that sprite for this frame. Okay? And that's what I'm doing here. Pixels per frame is equal to pixels per second, which is the velocity of my sprite, times seconds over frame. If you cancel out the units, the seconds cancel out, and you get pixels per frame. It's the number of pixels I want to move a sprite for this frame. Does, does that make sense? Okay. Excuse me, sir. Oh. Did you mention that uh, some Chrome browsers, or what's it like, some don't? Provide the number? <clears throat> yes. In those some, cases, do you just revert back to, the, to not doing a time based uh, Yeah, so, so, so the question is I mentioned earlier that on Chrome, when the browser, when you call request animation frame and the browser calls your animation function, there is a version of Chrome, I think it's 10, that, does, that passes a null for the time. And the, the question is what do I do about that? Uh, do I just not use time-based motion for Chrome? Uh, the answer is no, I actually have a more industrial strength polyfill that accounts for the fact that time doesn't come through and it creates time for me inside of the polyfill and it passes it to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, is that okay? All right. Anybody else? Question? No? All right. So here is some of the code for where I'm moving those disks around when I'm doing time-based motion, meaning the disks keep moving at the same speed no matter what the frame rate is. And the way I do that is the way I'm calculating delta x and delta y. This is simple stuff. I just have velocity x and velocity y, which are pixels per second, and I'm just multiplying them by the current frame rate. And when I multiply, or when I divide pixels per second by frames per second, I get pixels per frame, like I showed you on the last slide. So, performance. Uh, if you're running at 60 frames per second, you have 16, yeah, oh. Yeah. Quick question on the yeah. um, time-based velocity. Um, can that do bad things to collision detection? So if you're uh, at 80 frames per second, you might have moving beyond boundaries or something, you can fly with it. Yes. Uh, so so that's, a, that's a really good question. The, the question is, essentially, when animations are dependent on time, which they all are, right? Um, and the frame rate goes down. Um, I'm sorry, what was your question? Uh, frame rate is really bad. Yeah. Ah, collision detection, <laughs> collision detection, sorry. Um, yeah, and, and if, you're, if your frame rate goes down suddenly, yes, collision detection algorithms will fail. Because collision detection is usually done one of two ways. Either you look to see where things are going to be in the next frame and see if they're going to collide, or you look and see if they have collided. Okay? Either way, you're dependent on time. And if the frame rate slows down a lot, if it drops from 60 to 5, your collision detection routines are going to fail. And the balls are going to go through walls, and sprites are going to go through each other, and the game is going to melt down 
Okay? So, this is very important though, because with request animation frame, if you have an animation that's running with request animation frame, and you open a new browser window for a new tab, the browser is going to severely clamp the rate at which it calls your animate function from request animation frame. Do you know why? So it doesn't want to burn up your battery on the iPhone when you're in a tab that you're not even looking at. People are not going to like that. So it's built right into the HTML5 spec. When someone activates a new window or a new, a new tab, we are going to clamp that frame rate and it's going to be severe. It's going to be maybe two frames per second. And just as you pointed out, your collision detection is going to fail. So, on window on blur, you must pause the game. Yeah. You have to pause the game. If you don't pause it, the collision detection is going to melt down, the game's going to go to hell. Okay? So you have to pause when the window loses focus. Thank you for bringing that up. I was going to mention that. I thought it automatically did that. No. Well, it, it automatically clamps the frame rate, so your game will, will slow down. You want no, to stop it. You yeah. want to stop it. Yep. Shouldn't you do that in the current <coughs> the FPS calculation? So if the frame rate drops too low, you just basically pause it down? Uh, you yeah, you could do that. You could do that. What, what I'm doing, so, so the question is, as you're calculating the frame rate, should you monitor the frame rate, and if it drops too low, pause? And in effect, that's what I'm doing with that dialogue that comes up. Because when I detect that I go under 40 frames per second, I know things are going to get dicey. So I put up that dialogue, and then the user can decide if they want to stay and yeah, keep exactly. playing. They, you know, but they know they're going to suffer. So. <laughs> okay. A anybody else? Yeah. So uh, you take your bus next animation frame. If I close my browser and take an iPhone, and then that stops every animation. When I come back, will my pause screen then be visible since my time from my last animation? Would the span force the FPS that low? Okay. Uh, yeah, probably. So, so, so here's here's. Let me let me just expound on something and see if I answer your question. Uh, not only do you have to pause the game, you have to freeze the game. Okay. Let, let me show you what I mean. We have lots of time, right, Wesley? Oh yeah, you're good. <laughs> we got until three. All right. Very good. <laughs> yeah, <come. laughs> <coughs> okay, let me let me just show you something here. So, I'm going to jump up here, and now I'm going to pause. Okay, and I, I, by the way, I pressed the P key, so I, I have P wired to pause. And if I if I change to another window, it will also pause automatically. But now, as we're pausing, time didn't stop. Right, time is still going on. So when I hit P to unpause, request animation frame is going to start sending me the current time. And there's going to be a huge gap between when I stopped and when I restarted. What that means is, is that runner is going to fall through the floor. I mean, she's halfway to China by now, right? <laughs> so, so what I do is when I pause the game, I remember what time it was when you started the pause. And when you unpause, I take the current time, subtract it from the time you started the pause, which gives me the time the game was paused, and I subtract that from the last animation frame. But, and effectively, I'm erasing the time that you were paused. So the game, when the game I hit P again, the game thinks, oh, I'm exactly where I was when I left off, and what you get is that. <laughs> <laughs> you crash and burn. But anyway, he fell out of the sky at least, right? Okay. Is that okay? And any other questions? Did that answer the question? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Okay. All right. So you only have 16.7 milliseconds, which really isn't a lot of time, right? It goes pretty quickly. Um, so. When, when I started working with Canvas, and I started doing animations, and I started writing games, I, I went crazy because I, I couldn't figure out how to get the best performance. What do I do? Do I erase the entire Canvas for every animation frame and redraw everything, draw the background, all the sprites on top of it for every animation frame? That's one approach. Um, 
I could clip like I'm doing here. So here I'm using the clipping region. And what I'm doing is I'm clipping to that arc, which is the disk. And what I'm doing is I'm drawing the entire background. Notice I call a function draw background, but I've clipped it to the circle. So it only draws the background where the circle was. Okay, what I'm doing is as I'm moving, I'm drawing the background in behind the circle. Okay? I move the circle. I fill in the background where the circle was, but just where the circle was as it's going along. I'll show you that in a minute. And the way I do that is I draw the entire background, but I clip it to that circle so it only shows up in the circle. That's another way to do it besides redrawing the, the whole thing. I could clip certain regions, draw the whole thing, and use clipping. I could also clip, yeah. Um, when you say clip, so basically you're covering the previous circle with the background color. Yes. What if there's a set of color? I think you have to know what background color is necessary, you know, to make sure it blanks out or make it visible. Um, yeah. So, so, so the question is, how, how do I know exactly what to draw under that, basically? What piece of the background to draw? Well, what I'm actually doing is drawing the entire background, the whole thing. But I've clipped it to that circle. So when I draw the entire background, it only affects the circle. It doesn't affect anything outside of the circle. That's how I did the sunglass thing. I applied the filter to the whole canvas, but I clipped to those two circles. So only the circles have the filter. And what I'm doing with the clipping it's the same thing. I'm drawing the entire background. So I don't have to worry about, you know, am I drawing the right piece of the background here? But there's another way to do that where you do have to worry about that, and that's blitting. So here I'm doing what you're thinking of. I'm actually copying from an off-screen canvas on screen, and now I have to copy the exact region. I'm not drawing the whole the whole background anymore. Okay? So there are three ways to do this. If you can think of another way, let me know. This is all I can come up with. <laughs> I can either erase everything and redraw everything for every animation frame, which to me sounds like a bad choice, but we'll see. Or I could use clipping, where as things move, I restore the background underneath. Realize animation is really easy if you don't have to worry about destroying the background. <laughs> right? the, the, the tricky part of animation is making sure the background stays intact as you move stuff over. So, the three options are to redraw everything, to use clipping to restore the background as I damage it, or to copy the background from an off-screen canvas. So I wrote this <coughs> little application that lets me test that. So here I'm redrawing everything. And notice I get rock solid 60 frames per second. Of course, I only have three rings, so it's probably not too exciting. Um, this is clipping. Okay, so, so now you can really see the effect, right? As that circle moves, I'm constantly, and what I'm doing here, realize again, is I'm constantly, every animation frame, I'm redrawing the entire background, but I'm clipping to those three circles. Or I could blit from an off-screen canvas, which will look the same as clipping, because I'm doing the same kind of thing, except now I'm copying from an off-screen canvas, and copying it to the on-screen to restore the background. And as you can see, all three of these methods, where I just have three rings, all hum along at about 60 frames per second. So let's get serious <laughs> and do this. So now I'm blitting from an off-screen canvas. And you can see, now I'm hurting. Now I'm hurting. I'm about 35 frames per second for blitting. For clipping, I'm also hurting, down to about 30 <coughs> frames per second. For redrawing everything, <coughs> that. and I've found this to be true just about across the board. Now, there are some exceptions. Um, if, if you have fewer objects and a very complicated background, <coughs> then it might be faster to copy that complicated background from somewhere where you drew it once rather than redraw the complicated background every single time. This is a very simple background, it's just a bunch of lines. Um, but most, most of the time I found best performance, believe it or not, is to erase the entire thing every frame and redraw everything for every frame. Yeah.
So, so the question is, you're basically caching it and copying it as you go along. Yeah, uh, you probably get. Yeah, that, that, that's a, that's another approach. Thanks for bringing that up. I'll have to add that to this and see how that works. Um, I, I, I suspect you would get a little better performance than blitting or clipping, uh, but 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 I'm I'm hesitant to think that you would be faster than redrawing everything. Blitting. I never tried to redraw everything. I'm yeah. fascinated. Me too. <laughs> that was yeah. a waste of time. <laughs> for me too. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I've also done a technique where we stack canvases on top of each other. Okay. But my question, I guess, is if I do that and I have essentially a static background, is that canvas still redrawing that background constantly, or is it is it conserving memory when it's not really when it's a static background? Uh, no. Well, unless you're redrawing it, it's not redrawing a static okay. background. If you, if you draw the background once, it's just it's going to stay it's the same. Sit there. Yeah. Okay. I got to remember to stop <laughs> this. Control. <laughs> okay. Um, there's also some tools. Uh, browsers nowadays have an awesome set of tools, and there's two things that will really help you as a game developer, and that's profiles and timelines. These are profiles. Um, you just start a profile by clicking on that, that circle down at the bottom there, one of those icons, and it starts a profile, and you click on the same circle to stop it, and it gives you all kinds of information about every JavaScript function and how much time you spent in those functions and what you were doing, and it's really, really good information. There's also timelines. You can start a timeline, too, and this keeps track of all your events and how long it took you to download things and how many mouse clicks there were and when they took place and all that kind of stuff. And you get little uh, tool tips that show the details of each event that happened as your application was running. It shows reflows and repaints and all kinds of stuff. They're very, very valuable stuff. Here, by the way, is the profiler for when I had three disks. Now the, the important number here is right here. That's basically the amount of time I'm idling. So when I have three disks, 80% of the time I'm doing nothing. Um, when I have nine disks, you can see it drops now. Um, this is kind of interesting because the top one is clipping. Uh, the bottom one is no clipping. I'm redrawing everything on both on the bottom. And notice the numbers are almost exactly the same. But here, they're different. Wait, you're, the highlighted one is the one that's the dark highlight, right? So you're not clipping on the top of it. Ah, yes, you're right. Sorry, I misspoke. It's back, backwards from what I said. Um, yeah, and here you can see the difference. Down at the bottom we have 57, but at the top we have 67. So that's the difference between clipping and redrawing the whole thing. Um, you can start profiles by clicking on that little circle, but that's pretty coarse grained. Uh, WebKit actually comes with an API for profiles, and there it is. You can start a profile <coughs> in some function, and then stop a profile in some other function, so you really have fine grained control over when profiling starts and stops. So here's some best practices for animation. Use profiling and timelines. It's, it's a great way to find out where, where your performance bottlenecks are. Um, clip if you're animating a small number of objects. Otherwise, just redraw everything. Uh, don't double buffer. You, you may be wondering, should, should I draw into an off-screen canvas and then just copy the whole thing on when it's ready time to draw the next animation frame? And the answer is no. And the reason the answer is no is canvas already does it for you. All browsers that implement Canvas automatically double buffer under the covers for you. If you do it, you're going to slow things down because they're already doing it and, and you're just redoing what they're doing. Um, you should avoid CSS shadows and rounded corners. This isn't as bad as it used to be, but it used to really kill performance. Uh, same thing with Canvas shadows. That's gotten better now, too. You should let the browser decide when to animate. Use request animation frames. Uh, you should never allocate memory during animations because one thing you don't want to have is 
is the garbage collector of the brain, right? That's death in a game. And of course, you want to use time-based motion because you want things to move at a constant rate, no matter the frame rate. David, do you yeah. have any tips for not making the GC run, the garbage collector? Uh, other than don't allocate memory, no, I don't. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know if there's a JavaScript way to shut it down, but I don't think there is. There's not. It, there's certain things you can do, but I, yeah. I'm not keen on those. So. Okay. All right. So let's talk about scrolling backgrounds. So as you know, in the platformer, I'm scrolling the background, and here I'm scrolling the background, too. And then there's parallax. So if, if you've ever knifed your hand, through telephone poles as you were riding in the passenger seat of a car, which you have, right? You've done that through telephone poles, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, that's parallax because, because your hand's moving a lot faster than those telephone poles because it's much closer to you. Of course, things that are close to you appear to move faster than things that are further away. We all know that. And animators use that fact to simulate three dimensions in two dimensions, which is what I'm doing here. So I have actually four layers here, the sky, the trees in the back, the trees in the front, and the grass in the foreground. And depending on how close something is to us, depends on how fast it moves. So that, that almost looks kind of 3D. It looks like you might be able to walk into that pasture. And so here's what I do, I have four layers that I draw, all on the same canvas, by the way, and you could do it with multiple canvases if you want. And what I do is I just scroll them all at different rates. So. so here is a little toast. A toast is something that you briefly show to a user. <laughs> Great name. Um, I'm showing the frames per second here. I have the shadows up here because this used to just kill performance. This used to cut performance in half, and now it has no effect because we have WebGL doing all this stuff. So. so here's what I do. I draw two versions of that background, one entirely on screen to begin with and one entirely off screen. And then I translate the canvas context over those two backgrounds. And when I get to the end, I go back to the beginning, and I just keep doing it over and over and over again. So you can see I draw cloud twice. Here is how I calculate the offset that I'm going to translate coordinate system by, I translate the coordinate system and then I draw the clouds. You might notice that when I draw the clouds, I'm always drawing them at the same location. But they're moving. Why is that? Well, the reason is because I'm moving the coordinate system. Okay? I draw the clouds at the same coordinates, but the coordinate system is moving, so it looks like the background is scrolling. <laughs> notice that I save the context before I translate and restore after I translate. <coughs> So my translation of the con context is not permanent. Okay? I just want to do it for the background, not for the stuff on top of the background. Okay? So I save the, the context before I translate, then I translate and draw, and then I restore it, which puts the context coordinate system back where it was before I started. So just here's some toast, uh, just a div. I get the element in JavaScript. And then I uh, just set it to display so that it displays. OK, let's talk about sprites. So this is the same application that we looked at before, except now I have a sprite sitting there. This is the Android guy. And he's just floating in the air. He doesn't do anything at the moment. He's just a sprite. Um, there is no such thing as sprites in Canvas or HTML5 anywhere. I made this up on my own. I wrote this code myself. Um, you can do sprites any way you want. Sprites are just graphical representations of characters in a game. And this is how I implemented sprites. I have, sprites have a name, a URL, and they have behaviors. 
And here's how I draw my sprite, so if the sprite is visible, the sprite has an image, so I draw the image. And this is really the interesting part of sprites. Sprites have behaviors. So this sprite's behavior is bouncing off the wall and flying. He has two behaviors. He flies and he bounces off the wall. So the way I did this was each sprite has an array of behaviors. Each behavior is an object with an execute method. For every animation frame, I update all my sprites. And this is how I update my sprites. I iterate over each sprite's behaviors. And I call each behavior's execute method for every sprite in my game. Okay. And here are some behaviors. I have a fly behavior, I have a bounce behavior, I have a stomp behavior, stomp button, flap, <laughs> collide with Android, all those things in blue, pace and fire, all those are behaviors. And here's what the fly behavior looks like. It has an execute method that I pass some information, I pass it the game, I pass it the sprite that the behavior is associated with. And I pass it the width and the height of the canvas. And inside of that function, I make my sprite fly. And all I'm doing is changing his x and y location. The pixels from velocity method does time-based motion. I pass it the velocity, it knows the frames per second, and it tells me how many pixels to move in the x or y direction. And then I do it. So this just moves the guy around, flying around. Here's my bounce behavior. Same thing, it's just an object with an execute method. And here I'm checking to see if I've gone out of the bounds of the canvas. If I have, I invert the velocity so I bounce off the walls, okay? So what I do is I create these behaviors. And when I create the sprite, I just pass an array of behaviors. At runtime, I can get that array, I can pull behaviors out, I can put new behaviors in. At runtime, depending on game conditions, which is much more flexible than hard coding those behaviors directly in the sprite objects themselves. This is an example of a, of a design pattern, right? Do you know what design pattern? It starts with an S. Strategy, that's right. Because <laughs> this is an algorithm, it's a strategy that I'm encapsulating in an object, and then I'm using that object to execute that strategy. And, and the benefit of that is at runtime, I can compose my behaviors at runtime instead of statically code them at compile time. And, oops, I went the wrong way. Okay, we're getting close to being done, folks. So. Here's, here's one more thing. So, so here I'm animating the sprite. This is the same guy, but notice when he gets to the bottom, now he's stomping. You see, he gets really fat, and <clears throat> like that. So he's looking for something to stomp. And when he gets down past a certain point right there, what I'm doing is I'm running him through a series of images from a sprite sheet. In the sprite sheet, I have all the images for my game. And what I'm doing is when I see that he gets to about 50 pixels from the bottom, I run him through a different series of cells from the sprite sheet temporarily. And then when he goes back up past that point, I switch his series of uh, animation cells back to what it was, which is just one animation cell. Oops. And so I have a sprite animation. What I do is I just send it a bunch of image URLs, an array of image URLs. I create a bunch of images, set their sources, and now I have an array of images associated with this sprite animation. Do you have a display rate for those? Uh, no, I don't have a display rate. Uh, I have, so, so the question is do I have a display rate for the cells that I'm going to show temporarily? Uh, no, I don't have a rate, but I do have a duration. So I can specify how long I show that. So I could go through an explosion sequence for you know 500 milliseconds or 1,000 milliseconds. But, but I don't actually control the rate uh, request animation for any of 
So when you start one of these animations, all I'm doing here, you, you don't really have to understand this code, but what I'm doing is I'm just swapping out the cells, and I'm saying use these cells temporarily. And then when your duration is over, I'm going to swap out back to what you had originally. All right, last is collision detection. This is my favorite. Um, collision detection is a science unto itself. There are volumes of books written on this topic all by themselves. Um, there's lots of different ways to do collision detection. You can, you can detect collisions before they occur or after they occur. Um, you can use bounding boxes or bounding areas or if you're doing 3D, bounding volumes. Here what I'm doing is I'm checking to see whether a ball landed in a bucket and I take the two circles, one for the ball and the other a circle in the bucket where I want to see if the two circles collide. And it's real easy to determine if two circles collide. You just take the distance between the center of the two circles and if it's less than the combined radii, you have a collision. That's the simplest way to do collision detection. This is a more complicated way to do collision detection. This is what's known as the separating axis theorem. And this is an industrial strength algorithm for doing collision detection in either 2D or 3D. When I click on one of these guys, they take off, and these guys just bounce off each other. Now, I have to warn you that I do have a bug in this version which is not in the version in my book, by the way. So, so you may see something go through something else here. If you do, don't be alarmed, it's okay. Uh, but for most of the time, this works 99%. Uh, it's just a small bug. But anyway, this is the separating axis theorem, which has the uh, interesting act acronym SAT. Um, the way you do this is pretty mathematically intensive. So I'm gonna take a different perspective. To figure out whether two polygons are colliding, I'm going to shine a light on them. And I'm going to look at their shadow. And if there's no separation in their shadows, then I know they've collided. If there is a separation, I know they've not collided. Does that make sense? Of course, it depends on which direction you shine the flashlight from, right? So. What we do is we take the walls and the flashlight and we turn them into math. We turn them into axes and projections. So I project onto axes, the x and y axes, and look to see if the projections overlap. Okay? If I have separation, I don't have a collision. And you have to test all the axes of all your polygons. So this is what I have to test to see if these two polygons collide. Uh, I see you shaking your head over there. You're right. It, <laughs> it, is, it is not for the faint of heart. Uh, you may be thinking, God, this would be horrible for performance if you have to check all those edges and all those projections. But remember, as soon as you find separation, you're done. So you don't always have to make all of these checks. Yeah? Well, you notice that the uh, projections are not parallel or no, the, the projections are actually orthogonal to each of the faces. So if, if you take a 90, let's see how that looks, 90 degree from this guy is 
to make performance better. For, for instance, one thing you can do um, is you can do some spatial reasoning, right? If, if, if that little runner, in fact, when I do collision detection, the only time I look for collisions, or the only place on the canvas I look for collisions is right where that runner is. Notice that the runner is always in the same spot. You see that? He never moves. He's always at 50 pixels from the left edge of the screen. You notice that? You see what I mean? What if you go backwards? Uh, if I go backwards? Yeah, you got the left brain. Yeah, hang on, we'll go backwards. So. Okay, so, so what I do when I do collision detection in this game is I only check this area of the screen for collisions. Because nothing's ever going to collide out there that I care about. I just care about what this guy collides with. So I only have to check for collisions within this space, <coughs> which really cuts down on the number of calculations I have to do. And besides, I'm not using SAT in this game. <laughs> so here I'm using a much simpler uh, way to do it. My question. Yeah. If you were using SAT, uh, it seems to work for polygons. What about circles? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so the question is, SAT works for polygons. What about circles? Circles are a problem because they have an infinite number of sides. Right? Think about it. If you have a, a hexagon and you turn it into an octagon and you keep doing that, is eventually you're going to have a circle, right? Because you're going to have such small line segments, you have a circle. A circle has an infinite number of axes, so it takes a long time to test circles. <laughs> so, so, so there's a shortcut for testing circles that I don't really have time to go into, but if you buy my book, I go into it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I know somebody's going to get mad. <clears throat> so for the game, I don't use SAT because I don't have to. The game is pretty simple. I can use bounding boxes for the game. And I do that. I just have the bounding boxes for the, the little runner and the bees and the bats. And I only check in that one little area, so it's, it's not that big of a deal. And of course, the way I do collisions is with a behavior. I have a behavior on the bat that's the collide with Android behavior. And here it is. So I'm just checking the bounding box of the sprite and that Android guy to see if they overlap. And if they overlap, I know I have a collision. I don't know what to say, that's the end. <laughs>
Um, she might be able to tell you, but she's not here. Yeah. So the question, the question is, do I know of any platforms for kids for game development? Uh, I don't know if you guys are, are you guys familiar with Raspberry Pi yet? Yeah. Do you know about this? Uh, so I just got one last week, and I got a case for it. Right. I haven't plugged it in yet, but um, Raspberry Pi comes with Scratch, which is a Python-based programming environment for kids, and it's wildly popular. Go check out Super Scratch Program on Amazon.com and look at their sales rank. It's unbelievable. So it's very, very popular. Uh, that's probably really good. Uh, Raspberry Pi also comes with a squeaky environment, which is a dialect of small talk. I don't know how good that would be for games, but right. it'd be a great introduction to the program. So, so my interest in is If you want to run HTML5 games on a hand-me-down phone or tablet, <laughs> ouch, um, you're probably going to have to go to a framework that, like Unity that will guarantee that you get good performance. Because um, essentially what they're doing is they're backfilling hardware acceleration where it's not. And it's not going to be where you're going. So you probably have to, have to dive into the framework. Yeah? So the example that you have So, so, so you're wondering how I'm scrolling the background and drawing the Android at the same time, basically, right? No, oh. I'm wondering why you're not moving the cloud and the sun in the same manner that you're moving the little Android guy. Or what are the performance trade-offs of moving your coordinate system versus moving your elements of the coordinate system? Overall, it's, it, it will be faster to translate the coordinate system than to translate the physical locations of a bunch of different sprites. So for the background, I just translate the whole thing. Um, actually, I'm not sure if that's true. Uh, as far as performance goes, I don't know if there's a huge difference, really. Because you're doing both at the same time. I am. Yeah, what, what I'm doing is, is I'm translating the, the coordinate system to scroll the background. Because that's just the technique I came up with to scroll the background. I really never thought of you know, moving them like I moved the, the Android. But then I moved the Android after I scrolled the background. But, but the trick, of course, is that I save the context before I translate, translate, draw the background, restore the context, and then draw the Android guy where he's supposed to be. And I keep doing that over and over again. Um, it may be faster to just draw the clouds and the sun and the Android every time and actually physically move them. I don't know. I'd be interested. Send me an email. I'll send you the code. Okay. You can play with it. Yeah. Okay. Two questions for you. Okay. One, please. Um, okay. We do the Metro and it's Blackberry around the HTML5 and Instagram. Can you talk to um, how HTML5 games can go beyond the web browser in the near distant future? Ah, uh, oh boy, that's a pretty open-ended question. Um, Firefox OS. Yeah, Firefox OS is coming, which will be I a mean, big, big yeah, boost. You're going to have operating systems that. The rendering engine, or the the engine behind the web browser, is the operating system accessing low-level APIs. Plus, well, like Windows 8 too. Right? Yeah. Same thing. But yeah. Is it running as a virtual? Is a virtual? Like a machine the machine virtual machine oh. type thing. I don't know the details. I compiled the Firefox OS 
a few months ago, last November, uh, and it was built off the Android subsystem, and it had a layer on top of that. And I don't know what it is today. I mean, I know they have the Gecko engine backing it, but it would be worthwhile to check out the Web API project, is what it's called. So. I think also coming in a bit Yes. Yeah, guys. Yeah. 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 Yeah.